Welcome everybody, this is Dave Mosher, producer for Discovery Space at space.discovery.com. That is the official Discovery Channel website all about space, and this is your weekly wrap-up where I give you the three biggest things that happened in space last week. If you're watching on iTunes or some other portable device, whatever, you can get to my blog. I'm going to be throwing a lot of stuff at you here, and you can get more info on everything you find here at the blog that's called Space Disco, and that's at blogs.discovery.com forward slash space underscore disco. And that'll take you to the blog. If you're on YouTube, look to your right, click that more info button, and a drop down menu will happen, and you'll be able to click the link. Now, that being said, let's get into the wrap up. So, the first thing I have to tell you guys about this was absolutely gorgeous. Space Shuttle Discovery launched on Sunday. It's now orbiting the Earth some 17,500 miles an hour, and it's headed to the space station where it's going to deliver big, huge solar arrays. Each one of these things spans. Each wing, just one wing, there's two wings on each uh, uh, solar array piece, but 115 feet each, so that's 230 feet, it's going to unfold in space, going to bring tons more power to the space station, really cool. Interesting fact about the launch though, uh, you guys see this big, that's the uh, external fuel tank, that's what they call it, it's the big orange thing that the shuttle's strapped to. Well, they have tons of cameras trained on the shuttle launch when it happens, and guess what they found strapped to the side of it? A bat which is really funny. I was watching the launch through Space Vidcast. They do a wonderful job, and you can find a link to my, on my blog there. But they pointed out the bat, and I think Ian O'Neill of AstroEngine.com called it Brian. So I'm not sure that Brian survived the launch because that rocket exhaust is really kind of toxic. Probably killed him if he didn't freeze to the side of the space shuttle external fuel tank because it's filled with 500,000 gallons of cryogenically cooled fuel. So I don't think Brian made it, but, you know, Maybe he did. Uh, next bit of news I have for you regarding the space station. By the way, this is kind of what it looks like right now. And these are those solar array uh, pieces I was telling you about. Each, each one of these wings is 115 feet, so that's really huge. Now, uh, last week, all the, all the astronauts and were, were on board the space station, and they got a red alarm from NASA about a piece of space debris that was going to be really close to the space station. Now, just to give you an idea of, of how this works is, remember, okay, remember this graphic. I like to bring this up a lot. This is all the space debris, uh, enlarged, this isn't the scale, that is surrounding the Earth. This is all the trackable stuff. So what they found was a trackable piece of space debris that was going to pass within about two and a half, three miles of the space station. The thing is, it's going thousands of miles per hour, and it could do huge damage to the space station. I mean, we're talking tens of times faster than a speeding bullet and any piece of junk, whether it's metal or made of wood, uh, what a, you know, there's no, I don't think there's any wood in space, but whatever it's made of, it's going to do massive damage if it hits something else. Just look at the satellite crash. In fact, that added millions of pieces more space debris to the Earth, you know, on this sort of map. However, the, the, the debris that sort of sped by the space station this past time and caused an alarm was not uh, part of that, that collision smash up there of satellites. It was actually called a, uh, a yo weight, and these yo weights are used to balance satellites during launch. They kind of look like this, so that's where you get the name. Yo weight, yo yo, it's kind of got a string to attach to it. And yeah, so this thing was speeding around. At first, NASA said it was the size of, I don't know, 0.35 inches. This was about that, you know, my pinky nail. But then they later upgraded it to about 5 inches, so you know, like my palm or something. But I find that really interesting because that means they can track pieces of space debris this big floating around the Earth 200 miles above it. So that, I find that really interesting. Maybe it was just a mistake, but cool note there. Uh, next bit of news I have for you, and this is the last one. You guys know the moon. This is what it looks like. We'll see it every night, uh, almost every night. But guess what? This side used to not face us. It was this side. This is the far side of the moon as seen by Clementine. And that, that was a mission, I think, in the 90s, which mapped the far side of the moon. In fact, the other side of the moon, too. So we see all these impact craters, right? And it looks kind of looks kind of fresh compared to that side. And the thing about impact craters in the moon is they're more likely to impact on the side facing away from Earth. So here you go again. There's tons of impacts here, and there's not really any huge impacts here, which means that this side probably faced us 3.8 3 billion years ago, and then some really large collisions, you know, when it's still facing away from us, turned it around. So that's really interesting. This got bombarded heavily for a while, and then a couple huge impacts spun the moon around, and now this is what's on the far side. So that's pretty cool. This side is not the side that used to be facing Earth, which is kind of funny because 
the site always faces Earth. So that's your wrap up for the week. Thanks for tuning in. And make sure you go to the site, space.discovery.com this week. I have a wide angle package for you, which is a big sort of wrap up on a topic about NASA's midlife crisis. So I'll just tease you with that. Thanks for joining in. <laughs>